It's the story of my life. I'm gonna tell you all about it. Now I've had a drink or two, or three or four or more. There's no escape for you. Bisschen Licht hier. Bisschen Licht hier. Thank you. A 10-year-old trout tickler, Pharrell and Kitzler, from the Yorkshire town of Barnoldswick in England, caught the nickname Coost as a result of a random exchange with two unlocking schoolboys in a vague and drunken reference to the French underwater explorer and international TV celebrity of the time, Jacques Cousteau. Coost. Coost. This somewhat tenuous aquatic connection became somewhat of a self-fulfilling prophecy when, 23 years later, Coost, by this time also known as Coost Lardy Cake, and that's another story, pulled up anchor from North London, squatting and free party universe, and headed eastwards to Rostock, Germany, on the Baltic Sea, and the home port of motor ship Stubnitz. Together with other London-based musicians and artists, including live electronic dub act L.S. Diesel and the mechanized scrap steel sculptures of Lyle Doghead from the Mutoid Waste Company, events were organized, people came. Under the mentorship of Project co-founder Urs Blaser, also known as Blow, this new unorthodox crew were inspired by this unique creative space learning new skills necessary to maintain a seaworthy ship. The merging of these ex-London-based vagabonds, together with Russian stowaways from the St. Petersburg tour, which had just happened in 94, the ship always seems to catch at least one person in every port, by the way. In combination with our newfound local Dede Airborne friends, made for an unusual and productive crew, and events such as Cockroach Club were born, which reflected this new exotic mix, blurring geographic and political boundaries in a city which was at the time heavily stigmatized by previous mob attacks against migrants in the Lichtenberg district of Rostock in 92. After a year or so, the London posse moved on, some towards Italy to create the mechanized sculpture park Mutonia, while others returned to the UK. Coos remained on board, sharing Blow's vision to move the ship again, together with Russian autodact Dodgy Dennis and local support from the Orange Groover, Bastard Peter, Manichino, Gamla, Kundanlal, Wojtsek, Yats. Pinax, Crystal Fox, Smoking Tuna Brigade, Heights House, Nerfbert, Dave Langer, and many, many, many more. The emphasis moved from survive style parties and refocused on presenting and documenting live cultural activities. With Coos learning the ropes as cameraman, video editor, and camera breaker, which I just broke the camera half an hour ago, video editor and booker, eventually to become the ship's event coordinator, all the while improving his music knowledge and discovering strange new genres, such as noise, following a show by the legendary Japanese musician Mertbau, from which there was no turning back. The initial concept and funding for the project had attracted some cutting edge European artists, technicians, designers, as well as enabling some basic structural changes to the ship, which resulted in the creation of the Kunstraumschiff 
and the first tour to St. Petersburg, Malmö, and Hamburg in 94. When the tour was over, the money was out, with only blow remaining from the original project instigators. A small idealistic crew, adapted and improvised, often under severe conditions. In winter, the ship could be icy cold, inefficient, ineffective heaters, producing massive electricity bills, still cold. Without any more state cultural support, extra income was generated through providing emergency accommodation for ex-prisoners and the socially disadvantaged, sparking occasional wild and surreal interactions between them and the anarchist artists. The project regained momentum and the cultural output increased, which attracted more international attention and resulted in an invitation to the Stockholm Culture Capital 1988 activities. At last, the MS Stubnitz was back on the map, fulfilling its cultural transport mission. The project, the program, was expertly curated by Stockholm hosts, The Nursery, with an intensely packed program of high-level experimental and avant-garde acts, such as Muslim Goals, The Tiger Lilies, and Lydia Lunch. However, some of the lobby groups held a very different view about these activities, and after a massively exaggerated police raid, which resulted in the confiscation of completely innocent cooking herbs and a few old miserable crumbs of hashish, the ship was forbidden to invite audiences inside the ship, as well as forbidding alcohol sales, which was the financial livelihood of the operation. Not to be outdone, the crew painted printed T-shirts MS Stubnitz full of narcotics as a parody of the local newspaper headline. And as ever, Blow found creative loopholes to navigate through the situation to deliver our cultural offerings. Shows went ahead while audiences watched remotely on TV monitors from the ship's deck, with Stockholm's so-called rave police angrily watching on, unaware that their unit would be disbanded shortly after the, cup after the culture capital activities, in recognition that they were quite ridiculous. Subsequent tours in the Baltic and North Sea region, including a memorable tour to Newcastle in the UK, featuring acts such as Pansonic, Autekra, Soviet France, Wolf Eyes, a hawk and a hacksaw, and battles ensured the Stubnitz legendary status. Circa 2001, Kuss jumped ship to seek his luck in Berlin, where he submerged in the thriving squat and subcultural scenes in Mitter and Friedrichshain, organizing events, playing in bands, DJing. Here he jumped in with the screen print collective then known as Fleischerei, which evolved into Centrifuga. Last page. Still active today, Centrifuga activities include screen printing, graphics, trick film animation, music production and performance, as well as recycling plastic trash to create costumes, accessoires, and stage sets. The project is part of the Associ Association Unterdruck Kultur von der Straße e.V which exists since 92 and is dedicating to helping homeless as well as other socially marginalized people. During this time in his role as certified able-bodied seaman, Kuss would return to the ship for more salty sea dog adventures to help with the ship's crew on voyages to places such as Rotterdam, Amsterdam, Copenhagen, Stettin, Bremen, as well as an epic and almost surreal definitely surreal, tour to East London, which coincided with the 2012 Olympic Games. Currently, Kust is part of the Berlin Container Village Disco Babel and the project Organ, together with long-standing musical partner Annika Hansen, also known as Miss Vergnügen, chemo acoustic artist Bastian Maris, and a small team of friends. Here they make early Monday evening events with live organ music and the occasional controlled sonic explosion. 
Together with other players from this cultural playground, a soap opera, Mess, is currently being filmed and produced with Koost in the acting role as a rogue military special forces agent. How about that? Massive thanks and respect to Blow and hundreds of people who over the years have helped to maintain the Stubnitz. The voyage continues. Hey. Hey. What are you doing here? Telling stories again? Oh, just <laughs> out of my mind. I can't get over the fact that I broke the camera just uh, 20 minutes before we started. So I'm feeling, yeah. I'm feeling bad about that. I saw it. It just was like a performance. It was, but it wasn't funny, really. No, yeah, yeah. But yeah. Well, maybe we laugh about it next year or something. Yeah. Nobody's laughing now. No, nobody's laughing. But nice that you're here. Love it. Nice story, by the way. Is, is it all true? Some of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, Nothing is true and everything is permitted. Yeah. I read it somewhere. I don't well, know. Well, it sounds quite clever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's not from you? Definitely yeah. not. Okay, cool. So why, why are you doing this? Doing culture, what drives you? Still sitting here? Came in the 90s? I think you just get stuck in it, and then it's like, oh my God, I can't do anything else. I mean, I know in the UK now, they're telling all the artists, I don't see myself as an artist, but creative people, yeah. uh, they should retrain. So I'm thinking about retraining at the moment. Yeah. What's your, um, what's your idea about, what, what do you want to do? I don't know, what, what do you think I could do? You know me a little bit. A little bit, yeah. I heard you're, you're a farmer right now, like yeah, a, a, a little, little, little farmer. Farming, yeah. Well, I'm helping on a couple of um, farm projects outside of Berlin. Yeah. Uh, organic food and uh, collectively organized. I help a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So it's quite going with the hands in the ground, touching the earth, the soil. Yeah. It's yeah, healthy. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's good for mental. Um, it's a good antidote for the city and the madness and the. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I know. Or I can imagine I, I live in a city, but I go out from time to time. So, yeah, you, you were aboard and you went in a couple of cities with a ship. And uh, I want to ask you, how, how is it going with a ship and uh, doing the cultural transport? Like you went to Newcastle, London, Stockholm. You came to Rostock. You went to Stettin. You, was, you were in, in Bremen. Always on ship going somewhere and starting doing program. How is it? How can I imagine? How can we imagine? Yeah, I mean, it's a common myth that some people think, oh, you make events as you are traveling, but actually, because you need so much crew, so many regulations involved, um, actually, you go to the port, you moor at the port, and then you make the events. I mean, they, we do do the events for the half and tag, going down the river for the birthday, but these are very small events, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but um, but how did it work out? I think like it, it was in the in the late '90s or mid '90s, and uh, going to the um, early 2000s, making booking, program, uh, coordinating bands, and uh, making uh, the advertisement in the cities. It's just a shithole of work for a lot of people to announce that you're here and that people come to the ship. Um, how did you manage that with the crew? Or uh, yeah, this was the old school days of flyers and going around the bars and going to other events and giving out flyers, and which is kind of almost obsolete now. Or yeah. maybe it comes back. I think some people like to to feel a, especially if it's with this screen printing that you can when you when you touch and you look at the the picture, the flyer, it's looking different to all this glossy trash you yeah. see everywhere. Yeah. And some people they they recognize that and find that interesting, and that's obviously helping to sell the. To sell the show yeah yeah but nevertheless it's like uh, you go to a port but you have to plan the program in advance and uh, then you, you can't just go there and uh, and uh, be in the port and uh, next week the, the first concert is starting you have to print you have to promote it somehow had you had uh, have you had um, teams in, in front uh, doing some advertisement or uh, indeed I mean as we talked about the stock as I talked about the Stockholm was it boring was it or was that going on too long or was no it okay? no okay good. it's just like good. a nice story okay and thank if you. most of it is true that's uh, really okay. cool okay 
Uh, when we were in Stockholm, we were invited by uh, an organization who are connected with Filkingen, which is the okay. avant-garde uh, music where Stockhausen and all these cats were uh, doing their thing. Okay. And uh, so quite high level. And they had a really great program already laid on for us. And then from our side here back in, when we were in Rostock at that point, then we would, if we had any content or ideas, we would just pass them on to the organization. And yeah. if we felt it fit, then we would send it on. And as we were kind of thinking on the same way anyway, they would normally accept this. And this is a kind of a classic, classic situation whereby like in Copenhagen, you're invited by the jazz, jazz festival there, or there's always, there's usually a, a a group of booking people who already have the the program more or less fixed. Yeah, you you told in uh, we we talked for sure before we are sitting here and uh, talking just only trash. Uh, you, uh, there was like in Newcastle, it was quite uh, heavy with the media agreements or uh, the, uh, the 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 booking was quite restricted for something. I don't remember. I know some of these some of these uh, experimental musicians and stuff. They're quite they're quite sort of shy or. Yeah. Um, what's the word? Uh, untrusting of when you say, "Can we make a, can we make a video? Can we make an audio recording?" Yeah. And uh, it's, it's a, you need a lot of diplomacy and have to show people and treat them in a certain way to bring them round. <laughs> uh, some people just point blank. I think like uh, like uh, Pansonic never wanted any recording of yeah. anything, which is a shame because they really rocked the ship. It was. Uh, Of course, it's avant-garde and experimental, but when they play a live set, it's really brutal and primitive and great, great music. And of yeah. course, one guy's died now, so it's... I guess there are an there's some audio recordings which are around, which can't be touched yeah. because of copyright and everything, but maybe future generations in a thousand years will discover <laughs> them. <laughs> if there... Is, yeah, yeah, let's uh, skip that point, if there is a future. In, anyway, there's still one... I think it's, uh, oh, these are bands you maybe, it's yours. I had something to do with yeah. in some vague connection. You wanna? Are, are we on with the gap? Is that coming up now? I think we can uh, just uh, take a little look in some of your preparations. Like it's a selection you helped us doing. Okay, uh, um, well, yes, indeed. Uh, there's just three, three, uh, clips here a lot of the, the 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 instances and clips and ideas i had were exactly it was problematic to get the uh the confirmation from the artist yeah. they don't call you back but uh elias elias khan he called me back yesterday and said go for it yeah we sparky all mark from demented argo he did the same yeah and um the uh so this it's gay punkt effect Who is also my uh, 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 mitstreiterin in Berlin? She's uh, she's a great musician, a DJ, and organizer, and this is her old band called G Punkt Effect, which is G Point Effect. Uh, they were in Rostock in 2005. It says here, demented our goal. We're in Copenhagen, and we're going to see uh, a nice interview uh, uh, I made together with Mark. It's nice because Mark is absolutely. Diamond Geezer and hilarious. <laughs> and Animal Cops was a band that I was uh, in when I went to Berlin, and it's a, it's, it's a, a Russian band. Yeah. And it was basically songs that were written in the 80s, I guess, in uh, Moscow. And I think most of the musicians, unfortunately, had died by the end of the 90s, but the songs remained. And two, there were two or three people from this collective still going, and I, I joined together with them. Also with uh, Miss Vergnügen uh, from Gaypunkt Effect, she was also joining in, and we're going to see a clip, in fact, of her. In, we're going to see her in Gaypunkt Effect, yeah. and we're going to see her in Animal Cops. So I would just, just uh, say, let's take a look in Animal Cops because that's the band you played. Yeah. So, yeah, go for it, huh?
yeah, welcome back. This was Gip Punkt Effect from 2005 in Rostock. Also true, true, short, to the point, but intense. Intense. Annika Hansen, Miss Vergnügen, also known as Senor Depressivo, where she becomes a he, yeah, like in the song, yeah, and um, wearing a mustache and uh, and a top hat and singing very, very melancholic and depressing songs on the piano. It's very nice. Everybody's crying and sad. But there's a kind of joy <laughs> through sadness, yeah. I guess, you know? Yeah. And um, this is what she's doing also. A very talented woman, and uh, I'm very um, happy to um, help present her and yeah. her wonderful work yeah. here in Hamburg. Um, what do you think, like... Uh Especially today, we use the uh, media archive a lot, or we do it in every show we do. And ever since we are able to, we record every um, concert. Um, in a greater sense, what do you think is the worth doing cultural program, doing music, and um, try to make room and a place for music to bring it to people? I think I'm too much involved inside the experiment to be able to make a clear uh, statement about that. About in the experiment Dubnitz or in the experiment Just being in this uh, creative swamp of uh, yeah. like subculture. I guess I I, I kind of uh, identified at least until at least until before Corona, yeah. I identified myself as coming or being part of some kind of subcultural mass or thing. And uh, which subculture also means like no money, but it also means you so you collectivize, you share resources, and you swap skills, and you learn. You you uh, if you work in this context, you can manage to uh, create big projects, things yeah. that you would never be able to do alone. Which I mentioned the uh, Mutoid Waste Company and. Uh, the uh, the founder of that, or one of the main engines of that, Joe Rush, he he said something quite interesting along the same lines, which I've just stolen actually and rephrased, which was like, I didn't want to be in a collective, but I wanted to do big stuff, <laughs> and so I had to I had to you yeah. know ask around and ask friends and uh, and everything and. And again, indeed, with the Stubnitz, this is a kind of, although it's not a strict kind of collective, it's a, it's a, it's a ship's crew. Yeah. And of course, when you're at sea, there's no horizontal, uh, uh, there's no democratic decision about which way to go. It's, 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 a, it's a very strict hierarchy, yeah. which is uh, absolutely necessary. Otherwise, you're going to probably die. Uh, so, so that's quite interesting. This kind of, although it's kind of, you, there are elements of that from I remember from my from my squatting days and all working together and helping, trying to help each other and get stuff done. And this is also happening here, but it's it's same same but different. Yeah. 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 Speaking of squatting, you squatted in London before you came to Stupnitz. How did you know that Stupnitz uh, was uh, in Rostock and? You, it like you, you told your story, and it sounds like you went from London to Rostock to Stupnitz like a direct way. How, like, how did that happen? In I mean, we were all having a great time in London. It was uh, I was uh, hanging with these. We had our sound system. We were squatting every week and making free parties and doing ecstasy like every everybody else at that time. And uh, I was I was hanging with the uh, the Stay Up Forever Liberator DJs and. Uh, um, people, uh, for example, there was one guy, uh, Jake Black, who's one of the singers for Alabama 3. He was in our team as well. It was a very, very interesting, crazy mix, which you can only find in London, maybe uh, New York as well, perhaps, something like that. So we were having a great time, and then the criminal justice bill came along, which uh, effectively banned uh, squatting in private houses. There was a big demonstration. There was regulations against repetitive beats. And it was looking a bit uh, dodgy for us. So quite a few, then that's what, that's what uh, preempted me and the people from South London, LS Diesel, to all move over there, over, yeah. over to Rostock back in the day. It's like a fresh start. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, it just went directly there and went that direct. Was, yeah, I mean, we were all completely uh, begeistered, uh, really impressed <laughs> by this ship. For us, it was just like, wow, that's fucking amazing. 
uh, and uh, so it was a playground and it was very empty and we were used to being in cold and empty places so that was okay for us yeah so we just improvised and made our parties exactly like we did in some dirty warehouse in Hackney did the same the same formula caught some of the local DJs to bring the kids yeah of 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 correct age of course <laughs> not talking about children <laughs> Uh, and uh, and very successful, I think, in the yeah. beginning, and a nice nice mix of just mix of of uh, of of different kinds of people as well. It's a provincial town, so you can't just base you can't just uh, cater or provide for one particular audience. You have to cater for many. So, you know, if, if you get a, a cassette, we were still getting cassettes there from demos or yeah. a CD or something. There's no internet at the very beginning. Then uh, if it was country music, then it was a good country music. So then you have to learn what is good country music. So uh, these kind of processes were all happening. And it's like, oh, yeah, this is really nice new country, which was a big thing in the, uh, in the middle 90s, I guess. Country music in Rostock? Uh, no, just the world thing. It was yeah. it had a kind of renaissance, and it was quite sort of sharp people making really good lyrics, but just yeah. twangy and classic country, you know. So, for example, country or a reggae or whatever. So you have to go through all the styles, and you want to get the best acts and players from all the from the different genres. Yeah. And then what you discover after this process that it doesn't really matter if it's if it's a reggae band or a funk band or a oi band or whatever. There's there's, there's a there's a kind of a uh, a rule like maybe ten percent of each of these genres. These musicians are all really good, yeah. and they could pl they could interchange in these bands quite easily. Yeah. So you start to recognize musicianship, and uh, and and yeah, trying to pick out the cherries, of course, yeah, and yeah. not not just. And then of course sometimes it's a local band night, and then you have a different criteria because it's more about a social thing. Yeah. 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 Talking about social thing and uh, staying in Rostock in the '90s, there was the Cockroach Club thing uh, you were involved with and you mentioned it in your story uh, want to tell a little bit more about that sounds quite uh, like a little bit social work as well not only uh, making arts and music how social was cockroach club I think it was I think it was <laughs> on some level looking back at the time it just felt like uh, just sort of decadent fun like always but uh, I, I, I just because we had this mix so We were all foreigners here on the ship in Rostock, which had this backstory which was still still shadowing over the city about Lichtenhagen and this mob attacking a block of flats with some, some migrants. And people from all over Germany were going there and there was a big, big uh, media circus around it. So anybody talked about Rostock or you, well, there was no internet then, but anybody talking about Rostock They all, always thought about this Lichtenhagen story, yeah. you know, the rise of the Fourth Reich in Rostock, and it was quite sort of painful, painful, embarrassing, not embarrassing, but painful for a lot of people, of course. And uh, we arrived, and we had no baggage like that. We knew nothing about that. We didn't really, not to say we didn't care, but it was like, yeah, it's behind, and here <laughs> we are now. Let's go on. And we didn't have any security. And so people from the different groups around could come to the nights and would not be selected due to their politics or their, you know, he's a hooligan, he's gay, she's this, whatever. We, and indeed, there were some very, very nice nights where I remember looking at the dance floor and you would get the corner, which was from the Rat and Tat EV, which was like lesbian, gay, etc. And then you would get the other corner, which was full of hooligan bad boys. And then you would get the other corner with the students. So, and they would all, when it gets full, then they're all just mixing together. And, uh, and for the most part, it went on quite well. Everybody just getting on, you know, with each other. It's in, so in this sense, it was quite social and yeah. a bit, a little bit revolutionary because that was really not in the conscience and you could not do that. In yeah, it's, it's bringing tolerance. Only, only a people, only a bunch of foreigners were, would be allowed to do that. Anybody else would not be allowed to do it because of where they're, because of they are from there, yeah. and their connections and their peers would not let them do that. For us, it was just like we're just having a party, <laughs> and it, and it, I think it was quite. 
I mean, and then it, it ran its course, and then it started to be just boys with attitude, and then it got a bit uh, not so nice. Yeah. <laughs> and this was the time when the people from the UK, they left, yeah. just as much because the, ship, the place in Rostock is very small. They came from a big city, so they were, wanted the next yeah, yeah. thing. But for me, I was sufficiently impressed. Uh, I just recognized that I could learn so much here. And uh, yeah, and, and just, just uh, improve myself yeah. on some level. It's yeah. like you mentioned in your story, and uh, I have the feeling that's uh, quite uh, quite true. That in, in nearly every port, one one guy or uh, one person stays longer than expected. Uh, so you came with eight people, and then you stayed. Yeah. So that's the way. I also heard that uh, London was quite a clusterfuck um, uh, going there. Just it's a because the fuck, but you don't you don't want to. Reg I mean, at the time you got oh fuck, we don't want to. This is just bad, and you're under stress, and it's annoying, and like, ah. <laughs> but actually, with the benefit of looking back, you're really glad you made it. And yeah. what we facilitated there, I managed to get you know uh, my old mates, the liberators, the stay up forever guys. They did a party there, so it was wonderful to come back with a ship yeah. and have the old the gang on the ship, so it was a personal nice thing for me. You were on board entering the port, or? They? No, you. When you I was, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, sell, I have my, ich bin ein deutscher Seemann. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you I have, have the my, papers, yeah. I got the paperwork yeah. to prove it, yeah. I'm not really a seaman, but I, I make up the numbers, and I can, uh, I can pull in a rope just as good as any man. <laughs> yeah. Yep, I'm coming to, uh, back to London and the uh, clusterfuck situation, like there was the Olympics, Yep. And there was uh, this uh, block festival, uh, which uh, sounds uh, out of a distance. I wasn't there. I didn't know Stupnitz at that time. But um, uh, it sounds quite impressive. And there's lots of going and positive. And, uh, but it was difficult. It was. I mean, a clusterfuck is a good, good uh, description. Uh, there was a catalog of disasters. Uh, and the block festival to which we were invited. And we, of course, when we travel with the ship, we get... In, here in Germany, we have the cheap beer, so we are taking the cheap beer to the other countries and selling it at quite a nice price, <laughs> still a little bit less than everybody else in the home, in the place you're visiting. So this is kind of a very good income and very necessary, unless yeah. you've got extra, extra funding, which we never had. We would always only get enough for the gas to get there, the benzene. I think it was like 25,000 euro just for the diesel to get there. Yeah. You know, it's huge huge sort of logistic. Uh, so we were expecting to do this big bar turnover and the block festival to which we were invited in the East End, we were there, it started, people were like 10 deep at the bar and it was going, yeah, this is going great. And the DJs <laughs> and the live sets were playing and the other areas and tents around, and we're like, yeah, we made it, guys. And then after like six hours, uh, it just got stopped uh, because the 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 the... the the gate got overrun by by too many people. Uh, I was speaking to Carl the other, uh, last night. Uh, there were a few reasons why that happened, but one of the reasons, the funniest, one of the funniest reasons is uh, the guys decided to book uh, this guy. Maybe you heard of him. He's a rapper from America. He's called uh, uh, Snoop Doggy Dog. <laughs> so they'd organized this festival with it was kind of chin scratching music experimental, dubstep was very cool at the time, yeah. and, and kind of like a niche, niche music, and they'd sold out. So it was, the business had already been done for them. And I just had this vision of them. I don't know if this is true. I had this vision of them, like just a few days before the opening, somebody saying, hey, Snoop Doggy Dog's in town. Let's just, we, we've got an extra 10 grand. Let's just give him that and get him on the stage. And the guys, yeah, what a great idea. And of course, then it changing from this niche concert for a few sort of some, some you know, yeah, it's very nice, some you know, nodding, <laughs> chin scratching, intelligent uh, dance music fans. Uh, it changed from that to where half of London wanted to come, but it was already sold out. So it was just like massive, massive chaos. And the security put up their hands and called the police. And then after this, like, eight hours or six hours of being open, we were there, we were stuck, and we didn't have the gas to get home. Yeah. So then we really had to improvise, and we went to, I think, maybe three or four different places. 
uh, one of them being Canary Wharf, which lasted about a week or something, in, in front of those huge towers that you see in all the films. Yeah. And it was like totally posh with the, our East <laughs> German fishing uh, fishing ship there. A little very, bit rotten. <laughs> very, no, it was looking quite slick, actually. Yeah. And we've got some oh. very nice pictures of, of it. Looks like some kind of Philip K. Dick scenario. Yeah. Really crazy uh, place to be. But, of course, the people in those, those people, they're not interested in us at all. Anyway, that was one place. And the other place was uh, next to the uh, city, city where we were moving around the city airport, two or three places being pushed around all the time. What can we do with these Germans now they're here, <laughs> like this? And then we were, became a problem for that area. And being next to the, uh, the, the city airport was quite nice because it was kind of on the side and uh, the sound was dissipated. So when the big, especially the uh, British Airways with the big Rolls Royce jets uh, yeah. engines landed, sounded like a noise concert. And as I explained, I was by this time a noise freak. Yeah. So we we got oh, it's the British Airways, the Rolls Royces, they're landing, and we would jump out and, and onto the deck, and just just sit and watch the plane going <laughs> taking off or landing and clapping, and that that was kind of a funny memoir. Yeah. And that was the area uh, St George's Wharf or something. And it was kind of mostly like Asian or African, or people with migrant background, the whole area. But there was one pub in the middle which had Union Jacks and the red, the St. George's Cross all over. And big guys with no hair stood outside in the summer. And it was just such a bizarre, this little island, you know, it was just such a, that was one bizarre uh, 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 experience of that area, really strange area, the East End. And you really recognize it's still very much a gangster area and controlling it. And they were just got this feeling that we were, we were, we were just, be, they were just taking the piss out of us. And the, 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 <laughs> so we were at this next place. We made a deal with the people who were in charge of the area. And uh, they said, yeah, yeah, you can be here, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then after like a few days later, they said, no, 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 we changed our mind. You have to go somewhere else. And of course, to move a ship in this area, you need tugboats. You're yeah. a dead ship. You yeah. can't turn the engine on because half the crew were anyway back in Germany by this time. Yeah, the engine guys. And uh, so it's like you're pulling a dead ship around and it's just massive expenses again. It's just totally like bucketfuls of money, yeah. which we didn't have. So they, we said, well, you said we could stay here. We had an agreement. And they said, no, well, we decided against it now. Go away. Anyway, we're off. And they went for the weekend. They changed the code number on the gate. And we were like, oh, God, we got a program set up and everything. What are we going to do? And then we talked to the security guy. And he knew the new number, of course. <laughs> and he was quite sympathetic. And he said, oh, the owners, or the, it wasn't, they weren't the owners, but the people who were in charge of running it. Yeah. He said, They've got, they will be away for a few days and they won't be back. It's just me. I tell you the number. So we managed to do these events. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> and, uh, and it's okay, what's the number? And the number was 1945. <laughs> <laughs> they changed it in 1945. They changed it in 1945. For you like, German suckers. We, you German suckers. Yeah. The joke, the in, <laughs> in joke was, in fact, at least half the crew were, were, were we'd found in the UK. Yeah. And then another, uh, another quarter were anyway from somewhere, wherever. I mean, there weren't that many Germans on the ship, even though we had the German flag, of yeah, course. You have to, yeah. But, you know, you can't. Yeah. 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 Nice, nice story. 1945, uh, we'll show them. <laughs> <laughs> but we had the last laugh. Yeah, I, I hope so. Or, I don't know. Uh, Demented ago, uh, you, you, you told you lived with, uh, with one of them in your the sporting Halcyon times. Hackney days. Oh, actually Tottenham, but it's next to Hackney. And yeah. it's kind of one area which was heavily squatted. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Mark, he, uh, he, uh, we were all in this house and we had a studio making... Uh, we had this kind of like industrial Gabba techno band with performance dancers. What's the, what was the name of it? Uh, Distortion Abortion. Uh. Yeah, yeah. We wouldn't use that name again these days, but at the time, yeah. on drugs, you just think, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you think that's a thing, yeah. It was somehow <laughs> fitting for what we did. And it was this kind of, yeah, you know, like uh, fluoro. And, and, and because we had Demented Mark in the band as well, we, had, we were all wearing blood, and it was kind of like a horror show performance. Yeah. 
with like loads of us and silly dancers with bullet holes in their heads and we put on a kind of a show yeah and did that with demented demented mark and uh <laughs> so we all we were it, it was kind of like a factory it was yeah. a big a victorian house and in the basement we made uh like parties every weekend did the live show at some nice clubs like Knowledge, which was a really important uh, industrial techno location in London back in the day with Colin Dale and Colin Favor. And uh, yeah, we did that. Mark, wonderful guy, what a talent. We're going to see him now. Uh, he did burn the house down twice, or not burn it down, <laughs> but he set fire to the house twice. And I'm still here to tell the tale, so yeah. it's good. Yeah, that's, that's nice. So let's have a look for uh, Demented Mark. It's uh, You did it and there's Sparky also... Sparky Mark, otherwise known as Spark Retard. <laughs> Spark Retard, is, uh, it's also nice. Yeah. And you did some interview stuff for that um, uh, video too, so we uh, see My teeth were, uh, were, were a lot... Uh, were new then, so I would, my pronunciation and was a lot better, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. So have a look for Demented Go. Help in the storm for all you motherfucking white trash out there, you bastards. Members come and go, you know, so much, so much they can take of the madness and stuff and bleach drinking and injected LSD and stuff. At the moment, we got Stan the Man on uh, lead guitar and we got Grisho from an amazing German band, uh, Heartbreak Engines, who's uh, filling in. And my cousin, Ant the Horse, on drums. This one goes out of my fucking cousin, who's probably the best drummer in the fucking world. And I'll fight anybody here who says any different. And me, Sparkle Tart. I started in a band, Nervous Breakdown, when I was 14, drumming, and uh, they kicked me out, <laughs> so I wasn't that good at drumming. And I started <laughs> drumming for my own band, uh, The Rockabilly Rejects, and we didn't have a front band, so my cousin, he was in a, he was in a band in a little town up, up in Wales called uh, The Epileptic Herd of Kangaroos. <laughs> and uh, we sort of joined forces um, in Jordan, our rhythm guitarist at the time, <laughs> basement, his grandma's who had dementia his <laughs> basement and it was hilarious because uh, we'd be trying to practice and she'd come in every 10 minutes do you want a cup of tea boy do you want a cup of tea and, and jordan we'd be going no grand look we're trying to practice fucking fuck off and we'd be like oh you can't talk to your grand like that you don't have to live with her and she then she'd come back in do you want Cup of tea? No! No, and every 10 minutes, because she didn't, she'd forget. It was like we were demented, fully mad, and we were on the go. Like, it was like, yeah, yeah, we got gigs booked. Go, yeah, demented, our go, man, you know? Be a spot, make a pop. First heard the Cramps when I was about 14, which blew my mind. Yeah. It's probably one of the best bands that ever existed, or what? Yeah, fucking the most mental rock and roll band on the planet, definitely. That's just mad rock and roll, isn't it? But we, we never called ourselves a psychobilly band. The psychobilly, the name was invented by Johnny Cash uh, back in the day. Yeah, he, he, uh, one of his songs, I'm not sure which one, mentions the word psychobilly. <laughs> which was basically crazy motherfuckers with big quiffs going mental to rockabilly. And they were called the Psychobillies.
You can take it back to the swinging 20s, I reckon. It just goes back to the caveman. Yeah. Psychotic rock and roll. Definitely. My great 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 grandfather was a, a hen henchman for the king. Yeah, he was a freeze. Uh, uh, he used to behead people. He was an executioner. And my first job was in Lipton's, and uh, my, that was my best job. I loved it. it was um, doing the size of pig, you know, doing the chops and stuff. It was lush, great. It's like it's an argument for genetics, I suppose, when you think that uh, your relative was beheading people and then your other relatives were cutting up meat and things. Yeah, it's yeah. something in the blood, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Well, sing about cutting people up. Yeah. Dream about cutting people up. <laughs> At the moment, I live in Stoke Newington Graveyard because I got evicted a few, <laughs> a few weeks ago. So I've got beautiful tomb I sleep on, my hot rod tomb, which is shaped like a hot rod. And I've got my desk, guest tomb. And I've got my disco tomb. So I've, got, I've got the pole for the pole dancing. I moved in on the 6th of the 6th of the 6th. It was mental, fucking goths down there, fucking with ghetto blasters, fucking, I always just come out in the woods like, oh, right like there, having a good time, all zombie down, I put all ashes over my eyes and my face, so I look all, I'm like, I'm like, like where'd you come from? I goes, oh, I live down here, I live on, on 29 Tombstone on the left, on the far hand side, come and visit me for a cup of tea if you want. And none of them did, none of them had the guts to, oh no, I did bring two of them, and they shit themselves, they thought I was gonna stab them. Oh, bury them, which I was quite tempted, actually. <laughs> no one would know. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know who I am. I don't know why you're having it. Get a bubble, get a thing, get a thing. Yeah. Why, call out wire. Why do you see it? Call out wire. They come and down. Fairies at the bottom of the garden, shine the light, they're coming through. You just bought a dodgy car, you just bought a bodge bike, and you can ride it where you like. In the midst of the pale moonlight, the mushroom circle glows. See them fairies prance around, see them touch their toes. Fairies at the bottom of the garden. Yeah, Dementor Go, Copenhagen. 2006. Nice interview, by the way. Nice Just cut. My cup of tea. Yeah. My cup of tea. Is it tea? Or is it coffee? Like it's. It's beer in a in a cup. Really? Yeah. I'm pretending that ah. I'm not, not drinking alcohol. Again, clever move. Yeah. Yeah. 
So for uh, like the end of our little talk, um, uh, how's life going in the press? And you talked about like centrifuga, about live screen printing and Vagabunden Congress, about the magazines you're doing, uh, what the current projects you're into, and uh, yeah, mm -hmm. want to tell us something a little bit. I've been bit doing this the the screen print collective uh, story for uh, many, 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 many years. And at the moment, I've reduced to being helping with some administration and email and blah, or whatever, and uh, stepping out on my own a bit. I thought now that I'm all grown up, I might try to do something without the power of the collective around me. Oh, yeah. And yeah. How is it going? Uh, it's still in its uh, infancy, this idea. Yeah. So you've caught me at a good time where I'm kind of... Uh, fizzing with new ideas and new directions, but I've also moved out uh, of the city, east of Berlin, uh, living by the lake with nature and helping a bit on the local farms and getting a bit involved in the local. Um, we did an event last two, three weeks ago. Uh, Münchenberg is bunt. Münchenberg is the town near to where we are. And uh, Münchenberg is bunt means uh, Münchenberg is colorful. Yeah. And of course, the whole of Brandenburg is being overrun by the RFD, which is a sort of a populist, uh, the, the populist party here in Germany. And uh, there's a kind of a coalition of people from from all the political parties yeah. and from the church, and it's all very kind of like normal citizens. Yeah. And me as a kind of token freak in there. Yeah. And. Uh, <laughs> uh, and and I kind of like it because it's not this kind of like. Uh, 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 I don't want to bash the left too much on this show, but this kind of division, which is really rife at the moment, which is kind of find it very stifling and uh, not too productive. And uh, in this new scenario, I'm just an, uh, an I'm just me, and yeah. I can do some screen printing, and I can help and, and carry things around. And you just one of the other German citizens there, yeah? yeah? Yeah, because I am actually a German now yeah. since last November. Yeah. Yeah, even though I can't really speak German, even though I've lived here half my life. Yeah. yeah so I'm obviously I'm not that I'm not as smart as I'm trying to portray here because yeah, I can't you can even speak German. Like I can't this, even speak the bloody language. But we also decided to to speak in English that uh, the fellows in uh, other cities and you, uh, yes. because we are international, you know. I was going to yeah. speak in perfect uh, Hochdeutsch, but uh, he said, no, 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 <laughs> think about your friends in, yeah. in the UK. They want to hear you speak in your mother tongue. Yeah. And I said, Na gut. I said, <laughs> na gut. So you're out of the leftish cultural collective shit. Yeah, Coming I don't. I don't want. I just. I don't want to bash it. But <laughs> it's. It's in this. We, you know, this. This. Especially right now, you know, yeah. with this kind of uh, world turned upside down, Corona in the mix. Everything is just kind of, you know, r what's real and what's not real, and everything is very swimmy for everybody. Yep, that's true. And uh, anybody that thinks they know what's going on, then of course they're definitely the people that don't know what's going on. Yeah. So it's just you just so sort of, I'm just sort of like watching, like a, like a lot of us, like all of us, just watching yep. how this is going to pan out and wondering, 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 and uh, that's why I think it's uh, 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 when you start to sort of question. If I imagine like the middle classes of Germany and Europe, like s doubting w what's real anymore, the whole concept of reality and their concept and everything they're doing is sort of crumbling and they're losing money, losing their jobs and breaking down, then uh, then it's uh, it's also quite interesting. It creates new possibilities. Is the Corona glass half empty or half full? And um, for me, it's been quite quite an eye opener. And uh, coming here, uh, I recognised that the ship. Uh, there's an, an expression that was used by the river inspection, who invited the Stubnitz in ninety two or ninety four to Saint Petersburg, just before my time. And there, the the promotion they made, the posters says, "The ship is real." The Russians, the ship is real. I've seen it myself. <laughs> and this really stuck with me, and we still use this phrase for some flyers every now and then or for yeah. promoting this show. Yeah. And I thought, and I, yeah, I mean, this is, this, is really, this is really a huge, massive fucking 70-meter 
uh, two and a half thousand ton uh, ship which can move with a working machine and a crew and can just move around and uh, it's it's really really real yeah. so I think the importance of this ship at least for me and my mental stability it's, like <laughs> it's an anchor for me it's like at least yeah. the ship's real even if nothing else is. Yeah, yeah. We talked about in the. Um, uh, it's not ex Stupnitz. It's uh, if you once was here, you was always Stupnitz in exile. Yeah. yeah. So. It's a, like kind of a life sentence. Yeah. Life sentence. Well, it's not true. Some people do not come back. But yeah, that's if true. you've done a, a few years on board, then it's more often than not that these people are going to keep coming back and doing, yeah. jumping in, jumping out. So enjoy your exile, and um, maybe we see us in the future because nobody knows what's going to happen. Huh? Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, Kust, for your Thank story you. and for yeah. your time for us today. Yeah. And I would say, you, Stefan, we just yeah. go for the media archive once more. We have still some real good shit left. It's Action Beat and uh, Kid Kishore, which Action is uh, beat. quite... Kid Kishore. Rock. They absolutely rock. Both yeah. these bands. Support them. Support them. Have fun.
Musik der Not, da kann ich mich nur zu melden. Love. 